Good afternoon. Uh, we want to get started so as people could get settled a little bit. We have some more colleagues who are still coming in, but we want to maximize the time for our speaker. So I'll make a few announcements first. Uh, my name is David Lindemann. I direct our health initiative here at Citrus. So we're delighted to welcome you to Cesar Jedi Hall today and be part of our research exchange program. This is, again, one of the areas that we are thrilled to have in bringing experts like our speaker, George Savage, today to bring us the most cutting edge issues, not only in healthcare, but in other areas. Um, again, welcome our colleagues on the other campuses. Apologies for taking a few minutes. We've had a, a large turnout here and people are still coming in. So uh, welcome to folks at Davis Merced in Santa Cruz, which is a major part of what Citrus is all about, obviously. Um, you can also pick up the research exchanges. We do record these. They're available on YouTube. So after the presentation, uh, please feel free to share with colleagues at any point. So at this point, I'd like to, uh, I'm delighted to welcome our uh, colleague and a collaborator within the UC system, uh, George Savage. Dr. Savage is a co-founder of Proteus Digital Health, formerly called Proteus uh, Biomedical. For those of us who are in this space, it's become a real game changer and one that we've been very interested in tracking. And he's co-founded several other very successful companies. He's also a managing member of Spring Ridge Ventures. So speaks to, and today we've asked him to also address the entrepreneurial ecosystem that we have and uh, that he's engaged in because it relates so nicely to what Citrus is all about. Uh, Dr. Savage practiced medicine from 1985 to 92, specialized in trauma and emergency medicine. Uh, received his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering from Boston University, an MD from Tufts, and he completed postgraduate training at the University of Massachusetts Medical School in general surgery. And to add to that, he has an MBA from Stanford in the School of Business, and I think you're going to be, ex uh, as we, I know you're going to be very uh, excited to hear the wonderful innovations that are going on and how these new approaches that Proteus is uh, bringing forth will be game changers in the way we deliver health care in the future. So without further ado, let us welcome George Savage. Well, thank you, uh, David, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, thank uh, all of you for uh, the invitation to attend. It's a real tonic for me to be able to leave my office and uh, uh, journey to the sun-drenched hills here in Berkeley and uh, be back on a university campus uh, again. And it brings to mind the fact that uh, I should begin by thanking everyone affiliated with the university because, um, as some of my colleagues reminded me this morning at the office, uh, we got our start here uh, over a decade ago before we had a fab for making the integrated circuits and the ingestible sensors I'll tell you about in the back half of my presentation. Uh, we did development work at what was then called the Berkeley Micro Lab. I think now it's uh, named for Marvell and things have gotten smaller. It's called the Nano Lab, uh, or so I'm told. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and um, uh, that's a big, big part of our success. What I want to do to frame my talk is to begin with uh, the problem that's all around us that everybody sees, and that is that there's massive transformation in global health care. Health care in the United States, uh, the richest uh, country in the world, is hitting the buffers in terms of affordability and cost, uh, yet there's more demand uh, in developed economies as the population ages, and in developing economies as Fortunately, many uh, people are being lifted out of poverty. The next thing that you really need after you have adequate food and shelter is health care uh, for yourselves and your families. And so we're seeing that as well. In the United States, in the developed care context, we're also seeing a transition from paying for acute episodes of care. You're sick, so you will pay me as a physician to help you to get better and then send you on your way, to payment for value. There's this uh, sense that we're spending too much and intervening too late rather than trying to keep people healthier. And as, as uh, the main problems that we're all dealing with have shifted predominantly from acute illness, uh, a car accident, an acute infection, a heart attack, to uh, more chronic conditions such as high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, and, and other chronic ailments, um, there, there's this need to be able to wring more value out of a system that really is still primarily designed for acute care. 
Clearly, one way to do that is to leverage the technologies that are transforming every other aspect of our lives. So how we get entertained, how we shop, how we move around, uh, how we bank, that has all been revolutionized by the digital appliance, the supercomputer in our pockets. Healthcare still really hasn't made that shift. There's a lot of efforts underway, a lot of developments, a lot of back and forth as to where the tipping point will be, and I want to discuss that a bit. Uh, with you all, but we believe that it has to happen, uh, it's required, and that we really need to activate our patients and give them the tools to be full participants in managing their own care with their physicians and therefore uh, really activate them, if you will. And this is the reason why. This is the user interface for medical therapy uh, for millions of Americans and, and even more uh, patients all around the world. And uh, it really uh, speaks to a lot of complexity, uh, a lot of lack of instructions for a patient. Think about it. For a patient, uh, your view on the medical system today, if you're on multiple medications, are product inserts that are written in very tiny type that's hard for many of our patients to read uh, that list every adverse event that's ever been reported for this medication. Uh, you look at all these bottles and you're trying to figure out how to take them appropriately. Uh, you have copays, you have complexity. Uh, it, it's surprising that adherence is, is even as good as it is, and it tends not to be very good, uh, which underscores the problem. What, what we've got here is a point I'll touch on later is people focusing on developing products uh, for other people like them. And we suffer from that in healthcare. Other industries have as well. And what we need to do is we need to move from that approach uh, to designing the product for the patient. Uh, certainly the molecules have to work. We have to do the medical science. But that's a necessary but not sufficient condition for success. And, and really, this is what's going on that makes this such a necessity. Um, the common, uh, common statistic that the World Health Organization and others have used and, and stands up over and over again is that fewer than 50% of patients take their medicines at all correctly. And this is without respect to the severity of your condition uh, or what culture you live in. If you drill down on that and you look into how well patients take their meds in terms of perfectly, well, even fewer, only about 17% of patients are, are really good at it, uh, which implies that 83% of patients don't take their medicines right. And moreover, 100% of physicians don't know how their patients are not taking their medicines right. And, and exactly how you're not doing it right can have very big implications for what the next decision should be, uh, how to help the patient move to the next level. Patient non-adherence. Uh, it costs about $700 billion a year. There was a study uh, last decade uh, that put it at about $290 billion. That figure is still used. But if you update the statistics for current costs, you get to a much bigger number because costs are going up. And indeed, spending on drugs is going up as well. So we're in a world where we're depending ever more on drug therapy. We've shown the efficacy of many of these therapies can be very, very good. Uh, but yet well over half, and arguably the vast majority of patients, cannot possibly benefit from these therapies. So I would submit that rather than, uh, in many conditions, looking for more absolute biological capability, that is, the potential of a molecule to do more, we first have to focus on business models and treatment systems that will help us get more value out of what we already have and whatever we're likely to invent next. First point is designing, designing for the end user. Um, there's an analogy between where we are with healthcare today and uh, where the computer industry was 20 and 30 years ago. It used to be that computers were designed by geeks for people just like the designer. And uh, if you were uh, one of those people, either in terms of your profession or, or you know, uh, uh, at home interest, you know, <laughs> I, I don't need a show of hands here for that, then you would do just great. And if you worked for an organization and you weren't one of those people, well, typically they'd have a whole department of people staffed uh, who have those skills, who could set up your computer, tell you what not to touch, and, and get you working on it. And that led to some real growth. We wound up with 81% um, of US health households winding up with one of these devices in 30 years, which was a pretty, pretty good run. Um, and, and this was such an ingrained concept that computers were sold based on uh, the clock speed, uh, how uh, fast your hard drive was, uh, all kinds of specs of absolutely no interest 
uh, to the average person. Even Apple, which uh, we all uh, use as the sort of exemplar of uh, user-oriented design and coolness and all the rest of it, used to advertise uh, using the same sort of uh, principles about um, the technical superiority of their product. What changed? Well, what's changed now is we all carry around a computer with us. Uh, it's been the most successful product in history, uh, and most people don't even know it's a computer. In fact, we don't even call it a computer. We call it a phone, which is just one of the applications that this computer happens to run. And uh, things changed from circuit boards and clock speeds. Uh, when Apple uh, was going mainstream with their new smartphone, uh, they started showing pictures of puppies and uh, telling, telling people that they're going to work on what's really important to you. And the point here was that the very clever engineers at Apple connected with other people, uh, uh, people with skills in anthropology uh, and behavioral psychology who could sit down with average users and figure out how to make the product relevant to someone else. And this was a difficult task, but now you do not need to be a geek to appreciate your phone. Now, if you are a geek, you can do a whole lot more with your phone, and that's pretty neat, but um, it's not designed simply uh, for technical people. And we need to do that in healthcare, and uh, digital health is a way of getting there. The other thing we need to do is we need to restructure um, the business of healthcare. Uh, we have a business model that's labor intensive. I mentioned that it's fee for service, and it tends to happen after the fact. Uh, because our data aren't all that good, we tend not to be able to drill down below population level data. So I can say that across uh, a study of 1,000 people, uh, evidence-based medicine means that I need to see this patient uh, at a certain time interval. In other words, every six weeks, every three months, you need to come and see me. Well, in other industries, uh, they've departed from, from this, uh, notably in, uh, in, in the aviation industry. Instead of doing hot section inspections of turbine aircraft every so many flight hours, you now have moved to on-condition maintenance. And indeed, over 56% of the revenue for Rolls-Royce uh, on their fleet of 11,000 different turbofan engines in commercial circulation derives from their total care management program where they don't sell um, airlines the engine, uh, they sell them flight time. And the point is that uh, we will handle the maintenance. There's an operational area where data is coming back from sensors uh, and wireless radios that are in every aircraft. And if uh, an engine needs something, then United Airlines, for example, will get a message informing them of which airframe needs to be taken out of service and, and what then needs to be done with it. Now, we have to be appropriately humble about applying this to healthcare and incremental. After all, we, we know everything pretty much about how to design aircraft engines and airplanes. We did not design ourselves, so we, we need to uh, have a certain amount of humility about uh, taking the same approach with people. But we can move a long way beyond just seeing everyone on a fixed time interval. One can imagine a day, for example, when you have an appointment on Friday with the physician and you get a text message indicating that based on how your sensors are looking, uh, if you want to see us still, that's fine, but we don't need to see you. We think you're doing great. So text back, you know, no, if you don't want to come, and you can, you know, spend the day at the beach or go to work uh, as, as usual without seeing us. This is really being enabled by a revolution in sensors uh, uh, and effectors uh, that are all around us. And uh, we see this with uh, uh, existing medical devices like glucometers being updated for the web and connected to the cloud, uh, consumer grade products like uh, a Fitbit for tracking activity and a scale, uh, even medical standard EKG monitors now being built into an accessory that works on your phone. And then from the Proteus standpoint, uh, our unique contribution is adding ingestible computing. And where we think that this is very important is for the engineers out there, we're um, really trying to create a closed feedback loop uh, between the response to therapy, which can be measured through a variety of sensors, and the effector, which is the medication that you're taking. And an open loop situation of looking at your blood glucose and your heart rate and various other blood uh, tests, if all I have to go on is the patient telling me that they've taken their medicines, then I really don't know what to do next because patients are very unreliable in that um, because they're not, they're not recording machines. So this idea of closing a feedback loop is critical uh, as well as providing the feedback to the patient because 
most of us don't do well at getting better uh, at something if it's an open loop situation that we're in. So if I try to learn tennis simply by reading a book and going out on a tennis court once, that's going to work less well than lessons with an instructor who can help me correct my stroke. For those of you who are students, if you were handed a textbook in September and told to come back in December for a final exam, some of you would do well, some others would have more difficulty with that, uh, which is why we have homework and quizzes and assessments and uh, a professor or a, a teaching assistant who can help you with the areas where you're, you're seeming to have some difficulties and therefore meet the standard. Yet for our patients, we do uh, just the equivalent, which is to hand them a bunch of prescriptions, speak a foreign language to them for five or ten minutes, uh, two days later, it's very difficult to recall something for which you don't have the proper educational background for. And yet now they have to manage their own health care for several months. And we wonder why most of them don't adhere. And in fact, that wonderment is, is driving a certain amount of uh, uh, physician provider inertia where many physicians sort of as a... Uh, a psychic uh, protection me mechanism tend to cross their arms and uh, essentially tell the patient, well, if you really wanted to get well, you would follow my instructions. Well, of course the patient wants to get well. What we believe we have in medicine right now is an incomplete product, not a faulty customer, not a faulty patient. So what we propose doing also is to build our population data uh, one individual at a time. Um, one of the big uh, watchwords throughout our economy right now, and particularly in healthcare, is big data, this concept of moving to big data. Before we really do a whole lot of that at the healthcare level, though, we first need better data. Uh, the reason Google and others have managed to revolutionize searching the web and commerce and advertising is because they have an awful lot of data. They know a lot about millions of individuals. They know what I've been searching for. They know where I am right now, at least in an anonymized fashion. And with all of that data, they can do a lot of very useful things. Healthcare is still relatively in the Stone Age. We base major decisions about approving medical therapies and changing clinical practice often on very scant amounts of data, little snapshots, points in time, uh, maybe as little as 10 or 20 data points for each patient and some hundreds of patients over, say, a six-month period or a one-year period or so on and so forth, and it's very expensive. And that needs to change because while prospective randomized controlled trials are very important for testing out hypotheses. Figuring out how to motivate patients uh, doesn't require that. And generating hypotheses to test prospectively can be done most effectively uh, by getting more data from more people, albeit data of a lower quality. And Apple notably is making strides in this regard with their research kit offering and, and trying to really democratize clinical trials, and it's a good thing. One of the things that these data around what patients are doing in between their seven minutes with the doctor every so many months is that we can remove a lot of the emotional freight from a conversation with your physician. Right now, if I ask a, phys a, a patient, are you taking your medicines, the response is always, yes, doctor, I am, which means effectively that I took my medicines this morning and I'm a good person because I'm trying. And that's great, and that's really important. But imagine, if you would, the following scenario. My teenage uh, son borrows the car. This has actually happened a while ago. And uh, promised to fill the car with gas so I could drive it to the airport the next morning on my business trip. And uh, if in the next morning the gauge is on empty, uh, I'm not going to be asking my son, did you fill it with gas? We already know as a fact that the tank wasn't filled with gas. So we can move right beyond that and figure out what happened and how to prevent it happening in the future. Uh, same kind of deal when it comes to speed limits. You know, if you've been caught on radar going 75 miles an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone, it doesn't really work to say you were actually going 30 miles an hour. So um, uh, when we have a picture of adherence, as you'll see, it, it moves from being sort of this don't you trust me sort of discussion, which is emotional, uh, and goes to the core of a doctor-patient relationship, and the discussion can move into the realm of another lab test that you and I together are looking at, and we're able to say things such as, you seem to be having trouble with the dose of this particular med medicine on weekends or in the evening, why is that? And, and that makes a, a big difference. The other point is that we get to leverage uh, this amazing infrastructure we have here. Some folks think that sensors and medicines and digital sensors in our lives and what have you are very complicated. And the point here is that um, 
the mobile internet, our mobile data networks, is much more complicated. Uh, the point isn't complexity per se, it's the uh, appearance of complexity from the user perspective. And what we really need to get to uh, with healthcare is making this seamless uh, from the point of view of the end user and leverage the, the, the things that are already around so that we have ingestible computing, going to mobile computing, going to cloud computing, and building that into progressively our care pathways. And this is where re-engineering of our health systems will be the most difficult and slow to change uh, because we have the potential to really revolutionize incrementally and over time the labor productivity equation in medicine. Um, medicine is about the only area in our technical existence where uh, things don't get better and cheaper, they get better and more expensive, and often exponentially more expensive for an increment in, in effectiveness. And one of the key reasons is that uh, physicians and nurses and, and physical people tend to keep themselves at the center of any information flows, no matter what, because what would happen if I didn't see every piece of data at all times, the world might stop spinning on its axis and so on and so forth. We need to begin to reassess that uh, as a, a default condition for all for all time. Certainly medical professionals are critically important and will remain important, but we have to enable more of these uh, situ situations and scenarios where the edge of the network, if you will, the patient, is empowered to do more and has tools to do more, and the person at the center can uh, make more effective use of his or her time. This brings me to Proteus, uh, which uh, Proteus has uh, invented the ingestible sensor. I mentioned uh, our thanks to Berkeley for being uh, part of making that happen. This has been a very long road, uh, but this is a revolutionary food-based computer. And um, uh, it is the little speck right next to the uh, thumb pin that you see there. Uh, the dimension of this device is one millimeter square by 300 microns thick. Uh, it effectively is a grain of sand with a couple of essential dietary minerals on either side. And the power source is literally you. Um, I was very intrigued across the hall by looking through the tech museum and noticing the Beyond Batteries exhibit. Well, um, this is beyond a battery in the sense that we have technically a partial power source. And when you, the patient, swallow one of these, you become the equivalent of a potato battery. Uh, because on either side of this chip, we have a tiny film of copper, and on the other side, magnesium, two dissimilar metals. Uh, in this case, they're essential parts of your diet. In aqueous contact, they form a battery. That powers the device for a few minutes. And um, out of that, we're able to get a unique ID code. We have a 43-bit address space, so up to 8.8 .8 trillion separate unique ID codes. And we can associate this with medicine. So we've been approved in Europe and in the United States as a medical device. Uh, this can be taken along with your medicines. Uh, it can be co-encapsulated together in the same dose form as an approved medicine by a pharmacist under a doctor's order. And then now progressively, there will be fully integrated digital medicines that are made at the factory and prescribed as a unit. The first fully digital NDA uh, for a new drug is um, uh, being, it's under review now at FDA, and that's sponsored by our pharmaceutical company partner, Otsuka, and it's targeting severe mental illness, and we expect uh, a decision on that in, at the end of April sort of time frame. So that's the core innovation. Uh, the signal then goes to the patch, which I'll talk about more, and then onto your mobile device in the cloud. So what happens is this sensor-enabled pill again, lives in your stomach for about five minutes and then goes dead and becomes a grain of sand and goes on through. And it's signaled uniquely an ID code that is uh, conveyed electrically within your body. It's not a radio signal, it's conductive mode transmission, uh, if you will, an electric dipole that we receive with the uh, patch-based sensor. Uh, the patch is a small Band-Aid, it's this big, it's waterproof. You wear it on your chest uh, for a week at a time. You can swim in it, bathe in it. That patch is monitoring your vital signs, uh, monitoring your body angle, your activity, your sleep. It also has a Bluetooth low energy radio that's paired with your phone. And whenever you're in range, it will uplink the data to your phone where it's stored in an encrypted database and then also securely conveyed to a, a personal health record that the patient controls in the cloud. And the idea then at the server level is to pull in whatever other data you may have that's critical to your condition. Uh, it could be your weight, your blood pressure, your blood glucose, whatever the doctor has you outfitted with. And now we're able to make sense about the relationship between taking your medicines, failing to take your medicines, and your actual outcome and your result, how you're responding. 
This is how it works. We have an offering, a service offering built around this product called Proteus Discover. And it's really aimed at building this therapy measurement feedback and behavioral cues together through these uh, co-encapsulated medications I mentioned before. Uh, we've been uh, targeting cardiometabolic syndrome. This is uh, comorbid hypertension. That is high blood pressure in the setting of high blood glucose, that is diabetes, and also high lipids, so hyperlipidemia. This is epidemic around the world as too many people eat too many sweets, and uh, as uh, countries uh, and cultures uh, gain more wealth, they're often adopting unhealthy uh, dietary styles, and so this is becoming an enormous problem. Many aren't treated. And so the idea is to take this approach, help patients get to goal. Fewer than half of all patients, for example, in the U.S. with this condition are treated to goal. Uh, and then work on a value exchange business model where instead of selling our shiny widgets to health systems and saying, look at our clinical trial data, we hope you can achieve that, please pay me now, we're able to have a business model that says we will partner with you, we will assess your data, and we'll work together to see if it's actually achieving the results we've demonstrated in trials. If it isn't, we'll work together to try to improve that, but at the end of the day, you're only paying when the agreed upon results are occurring. So we, we keep looking at the results and we, we pay for value. There's, of course, a physician portal that gives you a sense for how things look. And this is a shot of uh, capsetabine, uh, which is an anti-cancer agent that has an on-off sort of pattern, which explains the uh, absence of data during the one-week rest period for this patient. And you can see at a glance how a patient is doing from a daily adherence standpoint. You can also then see on timing adherence down below in terms of the total number of pills and how they're dealing, uh, departing from optimal. In this case, in the early weeks, uh, the patient missed a few doses in the evening, but was very good in the morning, but with some timing issues near the end that might have been due to fatigue uh, as the regimen was going on before the break. Uh, you can see activity over time, as well as rest, uh, more rest being required late in the cycle of treatment as fatigue grew, which was the reason, one of the reasons for the break, heart rate, that sort of thing. So the idea is to associate the physiologic metrics, ours and others, together with the taking of uh, medication. Uh, on to some other data about value as a diagnostic. Uh, we've been involved in demonstrating that um, the technology has meaningful impacts on the clinical use case. Um, this is uh, the result from a multi-center UK hypertension registry uh, where we tried to separate out the system from the software. So in this case, uh, patients with uncontrolled hypertension uh, were evaluated uh, without any feedback to them. Only the physician got the feedback at the end of two weeks. And these were patients who, quote, had drug refractory hypertension, uh, which may not actually be a real category because you'll see after two weeks, 38% of these drug refractory patients were adhering at a high rate and they were also under control. Um, a further number, 57% actually did have drug refractory hypertension, at least on their current drug regimen. So uh, there was a spur to have the physicians change something here. And what we were really showing here is that simply diagnosing, just measuring, had a way of improving things. Uh, if you measure something, it can get better. If you're not measuring, it's hard to, hard to even define what better is. We've now moved and, and completed a randomized control trial in um, uh, 100 patients uh, using these um, uh, uh, antihypertensives. This is hypertension out of control, diabetes out of control, lipids out of control. The results are dramatically better than this. I can't present them in detail now because we will be presenting that at the ACC uh, meeting American College of Cardiology in March. And so uh, look for more. But when you add feedback, it works better. So measuring works. Adding feedback works much better. Physicians begin to make um, decisions based on the data, and the decisions tend to hit the target more than the sort of random, something's going wrong, I don't really know what's going on, I'll change something, which is often the way we work things. This is uh, how we see this. We see this as working in two different areas. One is that you can do this for four weeks or 12 weeks. Uh, the first is for diagnosing what's going on and seeing if you can get people into the right place. Uh, the second is to try to change behavioral patterns, something more uh, appropriate for, say, a diabetic, where it takes a longer period of time to change habits. And the idea is to really build in this decision loop into the software, into something friendly that a patient can use, can perhaps share with a family member if they wish, certainly share with their physician, and, and make those visits more productive in terms of getting them on track and where they really need to go. Um, really, what we're trying to do here is to deal with a phenomenon that um, 
uh, regulators and others have long complained about, which is there's this thing called the efficacy effectiveness gap in the literature, and that is the difference between biological capability, what a pharma company or someone else has shown is possible in a well-controlled clinical trial, and what actually happens in the real world. Um, one of the things that you'll, you'll note amidst all of the arguments about making medicines available and what have you is that both sides often have a point. If, if you have a very expensive therapy that, say, isn't allowed on formulary in a health system, you'll have patient advocates saying, wait a minute, um, there are patients who could really benefit from that expensive therapy. And then you have the health economist or the physicians uh, in charge of the formulary saying, no, it's not cost effective. And this is largely... Uh, the explanation, because if you're an individual patient and you execute the therapy flawlessly, yes, you may be able to do better. So in a, in a perfect world, you'd have access to that therapy. But yet, when moved into the real world maladherence uh, situation where no one takes their medicine right and no one knows how that's happening and no one has any tools to help anyone tell if they're doing a good job or not as a patient and how to do better, uh, it's not worth the money because against the average maladherence out there, uh, tripling the price of the therapy isn't really going to move the needle for my population at all. And so uh, these digital tools can really, really help this, um, uh, help this dynamic change over time. We think that's really important. In, in summary here, uh, our point is that if you evaluated this as a compound, if you took digital feedback and you, you uh, created a black box and you blinded the reviewer to knowledge as to whether it was a new molecule, or a technology or something else, uh, you would conclude that good data is the next blockbuster drug. What we need is we need better information about how our patients are doing, first for themselves, so they can see how they're doing and how they're, how they're missing the target and how they could potentially come closer and, and understand how important that may be or not, depending upon what's called the forgiveness of the therapy, that is how critical it is to to do things just right, and also to make those interactions with the physician uh, more, uh, more productive. I, I have to say that one of the reasons people go into medicine is it's a socially acceptable way to be a know-it-all. The same tendencies uh, that annoy people at dinner parties uh, is the thing that people pay for. You know, they pay for you to come in and know the answer, right, and tell them in detail what's wrong with them and how you're going to help, and you know, that kind of feels good. Um, what feels deeply unsatisfying for all of us in the medical profession is knowing that we have limited time with a patient, um, hearing vague symptoms from them, looking at their data, seeing they're not in control, not really being able to get the history we need definitively to understand how they're taking their medicines and what I could do next. And remember, all I can do is change the prescriptions. And so having the sense that the patient expects me to do something, I don't know what to do, so I'll do something random to make them feel better. And it feels deeply unsatisfying. It's a bit like walking into a dark room and throwing a dart, not even knowing if there's a dartboard in the room. So um, having better data is where we have to start so we can take better care of our patients and they can help make us take better care of them by coming in with information we can work on. And then that will lead to bigger data. And with bigger data and machine learning algorithms, we'll be able to predict very useful things. For example, if you have a... Um, a, a, a disease that has a declining sort of characteristic over time, one of the things that would be great to know over time is what's the best possible outcome for you based on current technology. If we know what people who look otherwise genetically and in other factors just like you, but are further along in the disease process than you, there'll be some who do less well, some who do uh, pretty, pretty okay, and some who do remarkably well. How do we influence what we can influence to shift as many patients as possible or give them the opportunity to shift to that higher curve where they'll do better. And of course, in parallel, then our pharma companies and researchers can work on better therapies that have better absolute uh, capability that we can feed into this improved system. So we think that um, this digital future that is sort of evolving all around us of which Proteus is only one part is going to transform healthcare. It's just a question of when, not if. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, that, that's a great question. I'll repeat it for those who are remote who may not have heard. The question is, what are patients' uh, response to this? It you know, could sound science fiction-y or what have you. A- and the response is off the charts wonderful, and, and I'll explain why. Um, the sort of big brother aspect or the who will see my data aspect and all the rest is, is a legitimate concern. And when we take pains to ensure privacy in terms of how we architect the system technically and our business practices and all the rest. And in theory, if you're uh, very healthy and you don't have this issue, it would be, well, why would I want to monitor myself? Well, you wouldn't, and, and that would be appropriate. But for our patients, uh, the need is enormous. Um, if you think about an average patient, uh, those who are just in the trial I, I referenced that we'll be presenting results on in March, uh, these patients, uh, um, over half of them earn less than $20,000 a year, uh, 30% of them had never finished high school, on and on it goes. So when they're going to see the doctor, they're taking time off work and they're not getting paid. And they go and see the physician and the physician has spoken a foreign language, trying to explain things and certainly the patient will think that they understand it. But consider that they're not generally prepared to think over through pharmacology and why it's important to do X or Y. And so then in the two months before the next uh, visit, they're on their own, and it's very, very sort of difficult and challenging. I'll share one statistic from that trial that we ran. We, we included something called a net promoter score, and for those of you who end up with a marketing background, you understand that this is where you take the people who love your product the, on a scale of 1 to 10, the 9s and 10s, who are going to tell their friends and neighbors, those are your promoters. Everyone else above five who's kind of a lukewarm promoter, you don't consider at all. Anyone who's below five, you subtract from the promoter score, and that, the net is the percentage. Okay, really good health systems are about 20%. People don't rave about their health systems. I think Kaiser is a bit better in the high 20s, maybe low 30s. Google as a company is very well regarded. It's 53% net promoter score. The, the iPhone 6, one of the most popular products ever, is about 70% or so. Uh, we scored 62%. These patients absolutely loved it because instead of uh, feeling abandoned and being asked by their family or friends, what did the doctor say? Well, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, you feel like you're being cared for. And when you go to see the doctor, instead of looking at your doctor, not get what you're trying to communicate because you're speaking different languages, you show the doctor the data and then the doctor knows what to do. So it's well received. This one here. Um, This question is is similar to the last one. It's sort of coming from from Eric Topol's point of view. Sure. Given his double-barreled critique of medical paternalism. Yeah. Uh, going to the language, I mean, compliance, adherence, a mm-hmm. little bit softer. This, this is la- the language of control, uh, perhaps not the language of, of interaction and relationship. Maybe a contrast would be to report card-based education versus family involvement mm-hmm. education. Uh, to what extent, uh, and, and immediately as a technologist, I think to, think to ways of, of gaming your device, you know, <laughs> the right, a, a, a cup with the right pH of lemon juice in it with a pet feeder, you know, going, dropping into it. Okay, we could game it that way maybe. That, that wouldn't work. That wouldn't work? Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, n- nonetheless, We've tried. nonetheless, it's no, e- it easy work. to go in that, in that direction. And yeah. how, 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 for your, your particular yeah. product, ar- around the area of, of a partnership between patient, family, right. and physician, and phys- physician intermediaries, yep. as well as uh, dental hygienists, hopefully, the medical profession will get onto that. How, how does your product avoid those extremes of just contributing to a, even a surveillance? Sure, sort of? yeah, absolutely. Um, the first point, of course, is this has to work for the patient. The patient has to be delighted. Those, those slides I showed earlier about the computing industry and so on and so forth, and the, the change, showing pictures of puppies and making this part of your real life is what drove computers into the mainstream, not advertising how many megabits per second you know, things can run at. And so the patient has to see the value. They have to be delighted. Otherwise, you just peel off this Band-Aid and don't use it. Uh, and you know, patients are smart. So if it isn't in their interest, they're not going to use it, nor should they. And again, it's not for everyone. This is not about control. It's about a tool to help you achieve your aim. And, and the whole point about compliance, compliance is a word that's in disrepute because that does imply you do what I tell you. Adherence is supposed to be the softer contractual kind of thing where you, you know, a patient and a physician agree on something together. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, nobody's perfect. 
you don't expect anyone to be perfect, but you'll understand how your particular pattern may be influencing your outcome and make better decisions. Uh, again, uh, patients tend to love this. In our experience now, um, over 100,000 plus ingestions and thousands of patients, uh, patients really, really like this. So I have a question about who's going to pay for this, and have you talked to insurance companies yeah. and what's their buy-in, and do they have any ownership, if you will, of the data after that? Yes, yeah, great point. Um, first of all, our ownership model on the data is that the patient owns his or her data. It goes to a personal health record, uh, and the patient decides whether or not to share it with the physician or family members or anyone else. Now. There's a certain balance of power here in the sense that if a physician can't get access to the data because the patient doesn't want to share it, the doctor may not want to prescribe it for the patient because we're supposed to work on this together. But we think that's fair and appropriate. This is the patient's data, and you should only, you should only share it um, if you really want to. In terms of paying for it, the, the idea is to pay for it in a value exchange. In other words, rather than uh, paying for a widget, whether or not it works, uh, you wind up paying for value. Now, that may be uh, embodied in a fee for service, analytics, data, whatever you want to call it, but then you're able to look back over a population, a health system, a provider, and see how well it's working. So it's value-based payment. Uh, a business model that uh, is in decline and that I think is days are largely numbered is the current pharma practice, which amounts to selling chemicals by weight for extremely high prices, uh, whether or not they work. And... Um, uh, most people don't mind paying for something, even paying a lot for something, if they understand the value and see they've gotten the value. I think a lot of the arguments we have around healthcare reimbursement and payment comes down to the fact that a lot of times people aren't getting any value, but they're paying anyway. And so that's what these digital techniques enable is this new kind of payment structure, and that's what we sign up to. So first thing, from a cost standpoint, when you build a lot of silicon chips, they cost very little, so the intrinsic cost is low with volume. Uh, in terms of how we get paid for it, we don't aim to get as much money for our widget as we can. We aim to partner, and we are partnering with health systems to say, this is how we think we should divide up the value we're all creating together. Okay. Last question. Okay. Hi. Um, excellent talk. Uh, I had a question about non-adherence in regard to the wearable sensor as well as if the ingestible sensor is independent of the pill. Does that introduce additional layers of non-adherence for the patient? Yeah, sure. Um, there is one more thing to adhere to, and that is the patch. Um, the point is, uh, though, that apart from changing the patch once a week, uh, there is no, it, it, other than that, it's a completely passive system. So instead of having to fiddle with pill bottles or press buttons or what have you, you take your medicines the way you always would. Uh, you do have to change the patch once a week. Um, that, however, is actually can create actionable data itself. So, for example, we're working in high-value medicines as well, things like hepatitis C therapy, where the um, uh, therapy is very expensive and where uh, a patient having problems adhering could really lead to failure of therapy. And there, supporting the patient could also mean supporting them if they fail to change their patch because the lack of data is in effect data to tell a health professional through an automated alert that you may want to give a call to the patient and just see what's up. Thank you. Thank you again. We really appreciate that wonderful presentation. Uh, Dr. Savage is available for questions afterwards. I'd like to thank all of our guests who've been on in other campuses, and we look forward to you joining us for our future research exchanges. Again, thank you so Great. much. Yeah, thanks.